This is Tom Fox. Jay Rosen is on holiday assignment, so I'm joined by Professor Karen Woody. Some of the stories we look at include the J.P. Morgan fine and penalty of $200 million for failures in electronic record keeping. Nicola is fined $125 million for its former CEO's imprudent tweets. Michael Peregrine looks at Sarbanes-Oxley 20 years later, updating the anti-corruption regimes or compliance program for other in France. Dick Cashin explores what happened to compliance in 2021. Jonathan Marks looks at the story of Netflix and internal controls. Vietnam imposes a sentence for wild dog trafficking, lawyers and ESG, and prioritizing your policy updates by David Banks. All this, some holiday fun podcast, The Compliance Life with Matt Silverman, and Karen Woody talks about her new podcast, Classroom Insider. All of these stories, podcast, Karen Woody, and more on This Week in FCPA. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and welcome to This Week in FCPA, episode 282 for the week ending December 24th, 2021, the Naughty List edition. With Jay on a holiday assignment, I am joined by Professor Karen Woody to look at some of the week's top compliance and ethics stories in this week on the Naughty List edition. Karen, we have had some companies who have been very naughty in 2021. Uh, There may be lots of lumps of coal going out, and I wanted to start with um, J.P. Morgan because they were embroiled in a enforcement action involving both the Securities and Exchange Commission and the CFTC for failures in electronic record keeping. And this was not um, a one-off failure. This was a $200 million total fines and penalties failure. And I found this uh, a very interesting case, particularly from the um, SEC perspective. Neither uh, the SEC order or the CFTC order really went into to a lot of detail that we typically see, but the um, it was pretty clear to me that at least from the SEC's perspective, they were very upset with J.P. Morgan, and they were upset because uh, they had policies and procedures which were not followed. They had supervisors who were in charge of training their employees and then overseeing them and monitoring on these procedures and policies and procedures, and the supervisors were some of the most recalcitrants. And by electronic record keeping, uh, it was, I probably should have specified, it was in the trading function where uh, by mandate, by federal mandate, they have to record transactions. For those who may think this is a new requirement, it's not. I can remember uh, doing arbitrations involving trading cases in the 90s, and they actually physically recorded all calls. Uh, for, and that was a fabulous record. If you had uh, any sort of dispute thereafter, we've gotten a little more sophisticated, and you don't have cassette recordings anymore, but those same rules and regs existed. And there was a complete, total, and utter failure by the compliance function who was charged with overseeing this, and uh, the actual implementation went down to the front line to these supervisors. The um, supervisors uh, used WhatsApp uh, and Slack, Zoom and other uh, ephemeral messaging uh, strategies to have literally thousands of text messages that were not available. Uh, Unfortunately for J.P. Morgan, they seem to be unaware this was going on to the point where uh, the issue arose for Morgan, for J.P. Morgan, when the SEC was investigating some counterparties on trades. The counterparties produced the text messaging Uh, The SEC went to J.P. Morgan and said, uh, why haven't you told us about this? And then they laid a subpoena on them, and J.P. Morgan didn't respond to the subpoena. One way to piss off the regulators. Then uh, when the SEC came back and said, no, 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 we really meant it, Uh, produce all of this, uh, J.P. Morgan did a deeper dive and found out, well, maybe we do have some records, uh, which once again is not good in the eyes of the regulators. So a, a massive fine and penalty, by far the largest for the failure. And th- the thing that struck me, Karen, was that there was no illegal behavior, or uncovered rather, uh, that came up because of this. It was simply this failure to engage in mandated 
uh, electronic record keeping. So uh, I thought a lot of lessons for the compliance professional that perhaps we can talk about. But uh, you were also intrigued with the Nicola fine. Uh, and I wanted to hear your take on that. Sure. Well, uh, as I'm assuming many of your listeners are aware, Nicola, um, the uh, elec- I guess it's not even electronic. It's a uh, company that <laughs> ostensibly makes hydrogen powered trucks or Plan Sue is in the works of making those uh, trucks and vehicles on hydrogen power. Um, just this week, they settled with the SEC for $125 million um, to settle uh, a number of allegations about the failure uh, of the company to prevent its then CEO, Trevor Milton, from making a number of allegedly false uh, statements about the products and about the company and about. Um, you know, whether they work or not. And so famously there's a a video that is posted where, you know, they think the truck is moving on its own power, but it turns out it's actually just uh, rolling down a hill. And then they altered the video to make it look like it was operating in its own power. They just, they shifted the video uh, frame. So it looked like it was going straight instead of downhill. So those things, again, like your story, don't look great. And the regulators are not very happy about it. Uh, what's most fascinating about this case is the fact that um, Nicola went public via SPAC. And so the timeline here, I think, is very interesting. And I would argue maybe somewhat problematic in terms of the enforcement ability of the SEC in the sense that uh, Nicola merged with a company called Vetco um, IQ. And that merger occurred in March, I believe, of 2020. Vetco IQ, again, via SPAC, went public uh, in May 2018 via IPO. It then had, at that point, 24 months to find a partner to do sort of the marriage of the SPAC. And they managed to do that just right down to the wire um, only a few months before that 24-month window expired. And they obviously merged with Nikola, at which point they then de and that is how Nikola is trading. The reason um, I think it's interesting is that a number of these statements and uh, you know propaganda that Trevor Milton was making via tweets and via podcasts, a lot of that happened prior to the de point, meaning Nikola isn't at that point itself a publicly traded company. And so more than just sort of this, you know, interesting, you know, fraudulent seeming uh, activity by, you know, a hot company that, you know, there's no irony that it's called Nikola because it's supposed to be sort of a a cousin to Tesla in some ways, although those companies are not related. Obviously, that's a sort of fun, sexy new company. But I think the bigger story here is this, you know, clear push to regulate SPACs. Given the fact that some people might argue that SPACs are kind of a Trojan horse around an IPO and these regulations about conditioning the market and all the sort of standard IPO regulations that are in existence, SPAC mergers and the way that companies go public via SPAC is in some ways an end around some of those regulations. And here we have the SEC going after statements and propaganda and things that look like it's very much conditioning the market. Um, things that wouldn't be allowed if this company had gone public via IPO. So I think this story really is more about the SPAC structure, this idea that the SEC very much wants to push back or at least get um, additional eyes on and regulation around companies that go public in this manner. And so obviously Trevor Milton um, is indicted and is still um, in, in the midst of fighting his own individual charges on this. Uh, All of that will still play out through next year, but the company has settled in a no admit and no deny. Um, The company, the angle on the company, though, like the J.P. Morgan story, is very much one that is important for all compliance officers because the issue with the company really was this inability to rein in the CEO from saying certain things that the company, I think, knew could be certainly very problematic uh, and so it, it, the lesson for compliance officers is certainly to make sure that there is some ability to check what is being said by these sort of rock star CEOs as they are out trying to raise money um, for the companies or even just describing the new technology that they're bringing to market. 
So, like I said, two things. A major um, lesson for compliance um, officers and compliance professionals, but also a bigger lesson, I think, for SPACs and and how SPACs need to be very careful about who they are merging with and maybe the baggage uh, that comes when you are um, merging with new companies uh, in that way. Karen, I thought there was lots of lessons learned. And uh, let me just continue your thoughts on SPACs because – the SEC obviously is troubled by SPACs. They're troubled by their inability to regulate anything up until the time of the de when the acquired company goes public. Do you think the SEC might use this as a way to leverage perhaps more control in the pre-acquisition period or something like that? I think so. And we've seen a little of that um, before with the SEC, even stepping in before a de point to say the due diligence wasn't sufficient. Um, I think Gensler very much has this on his radar and the SEC more broadly does to ensure, again, they have a real uh, worry that this this type of structure is problematic to investors and they think in their, you know, in their mission to protect investors, really looking at what investors are aware of, the amount of disclosure they have seen both in the merger and then in the de points. Uh, all of that really is going to be uh, closely scrutinized by the regulators because they do. I think they are concerned that SPACs are, you know, a shortcut to the market um, and are an end around some of, like, again, the very robust structure that is required to go public via IPO. But if you're at the SEC, you would argue that that is because it's to protect investors. They know what they're buying. They know what they're getting into. And there's not as much of that protection when you're dealing with SPACs. Karen, uh, if this case sounds somewhat familiar or suspiciously familiar, uh, we might uh, think about Elon Musk, uh, who famously gave a tweet of, uh, I think it was $420 a share to take uh, Tesla private. Uh, he got that didn't happen. Eventually, that did not happen. He got into hot water with the SEC, and the SEC fined him twenty million dollars. It's a huge leap from twenty million to one hundred and seventy-five million. So I was intrigued to maybe ask you, uh, really, the difference in those fines and penalties. Is it uh, partly the not only the quality or lack thereof of Mr. Milton's tweets, but the ubiquitousness of them, as opposed to Musk with uh, just a one or a few tweets, and then the remedy put in place that you already hit on, which is somebody has to oversee and review these, did that really come out of uh, what we saw the SEC say or do to Elon Musk? Sure. I mean, Elon is always in the headlines and has always had somewhat of a target on his back, and some of that is justified based on his behavior, as we all as we all know um, in some ways. Uh, I think, again, I would... Harking back to what I think is the major takeaway from the Nikola case is that it is the SPAC. I think it's really looking more closely and scrutinizing more closely companies that don't have, like Tesla, sort of years of documentation, years of public filings. Um, and, and so I think there was, I think that is the shot across the bow that might explain some of the, you know, the tighter screws on this particular uh, enforcement action. Um, and then I think uh, with Elon, the, the tweets weren't entirely about the product. I mean, it was just – it's him sort of spouting off at that point even making a joke that he later claimed had to do with, you know, marijuana culture and 420. I mean, he's he's sort of a bit of a just joker, whereas I think Milton really was pumping up the market for people considering investing in his company so I think the timeline of those two um, those two individuals and when they're making those statements really factors into the risk that the SEC sees when, when those statements are made. Uh, the other thing that intrigued me, uh, and particularly around your thoughts on uh, Elon Musk and his fine and penalty, was uh, we're all uh, looking towards the jury uh, to make a decision in the Elizabeth Holmes case. And we saw lots of testimony about claims she allegedly made during her uh, CEO ship of Theranos, and now we see uh, Trevor Milton and how he tried to sell uh, Nicola. Uh, certainly prior to going public, and even after despacking it and going public, and it really pointed to me the difference in mentality and approaches uh, from companies trying to raise money privately uh, 
i.e., not in the public markets, and those uh, that that are in the public market, uh, how, how does how is let me see if I can ask the question correctly. How does a CEO make that shift from cheerleader and uh, raiser of funds to uh, CEO of a public company with lots more obligations? Is it uh, it's such a high failure rate that you really need to bring in a new leadership team after you go public? Uh, can someone who really is a visionary or at least believe they're a visionary and wants to, to sell that vision, even if they have to fake it till they make it, uh, is that person capable of, of doing the things necessary to run a public company? And how do you evaluate that in due diligence? That's a great question. And, and I mean, even just the sort of behavioral, you know, psychology of that is that you can't imagine in some of these sort of rock star CEOs that come up with these ideas and, and raise money privately, stepping aside once, you know, they're, they can finally launch the company. I mean, that, that is a big ask of, I think, anyone, honestly. Um, but I, I, I do think that uh, this idea of um, being cheerleader, raising funds, doing it privately, and, and then shifting to recognizing the very um, strict, as I said, to robust structure around what can be said and what can't be said when your company then is going public and getting um, investors from anywhere. That distinction, I think, really is is the cornerstone of a lot of securities laws. And so there should be, again, a lot of due diligence. I hope a lot of attorneys and compliance professionals involved in that very important shift from going from private to public. And so it's not new, I don't think. I think we've seen a lot of people recently, you know, sort of have a lot of foot faults on that. But I think you're pointing out exactly one of the issues, which is it's hard to step away. It's hard to shift gears and, and, you know, actually enter into what is sort of seen as the quiet period before going public and those type of things. That's a tricky, uh, that's a tricky place to to be. And so I think the board really needs to step up and the compliance professionals need to make clear what is allowed and what is not allowed because it's, it's a tricky shift that I think a lot of CEOs aren't maybe fully aware of. Now let me shift back to uh, JP Morgan. And the first thing I wanted to ask you is, I know you've sat across from the SEC in negotiations when you were in private practice, and I've talked to a lot of white-collar practitioners, uh, both former DOJers and those uh, who've not been in the government. And to a man or a woman, they all say the most important thing when you sit across from the regulators is your credibility. Uh, Because if you self-report, usually the first or second question is, do you have the documents tied down? And you have to be able to answer that accurately and uh, because if you don't uh, and you don't have them tied down and you represent you do have them tied down, it's going to hurt you, your credibility throughout that investigation. And it may hurt your credibility uh, professionally down the line as well. So when I saw that the SEC, one, had to go to J.P. Morgan, not once but twice, uh, and then read some of the uh, uh, language in the uh, order, it seemed to me that uh, that credibility was lacking uh, for J.P. Morgan and that the SEC uh, really penalized Morgan because they, one, misrepresented intentionally or not, or unintentionally, I should say. And then uh, they couldn't still uh, answer the SEC when the SEC had the evidence in, in uh, form of the, the counterparty's documentation of electronic record keeping. So I really wanted to start with asking you, uh, from your from your perspective, uh, is that credibility as critical with the SEC as it is with the DOJ or other regulators? Absolutely. I mean, it really a lot of these negotiations are built on trust. It's a lot of the reason why some of the big partners at all these you know large DC New York firms are former regulators uh, because you know the pitch even for them to get some of the cases is. I know these people I used to work there. There's a trust already existing, so we'll be able to go in and really negotiate because we're already coming from an existing relationship. Uh, I I mean, some people call that the revolving door of Washington, but I do think there's some purpose to it, which is exactly that, this idea that I trust this person. I used to work with them, and so it's easy for me to figure out how to start these negotiations from a place where we can both walk away feeling like we uh, have achieved something that we want out of it. And so this idea that, 
you know, especially the things like that the SEC discovered some of this by virtue of doing other uh, and looking into other companies and then learning this about J.P. Morgan. Every all of the facts around this particular story suggest that the SEC is fed up and that they, you know, J.P. Morgan very much breached that trust if there if there was any. So I think you're you're way you're really um, you're on your back foot if you're J.P. Morgan and not going in again, sort of acknowledging what you did or or self-reporting or, or setting up some understanding that you're willing to comply with uh, the regulators. It, it's not it's not a good look for J.P. Morgan. You're right. There was also a requirement in the J.P. Morgan SEC uh, cease and desist order for what they called a, quote, compliance consultant, end quote, to oversee J.P. Morgan's execution of its obligations under the order and building out its compliance program around electronic uh, record keeping. Uh, I have to say, uh, I can't even say compliance consultant because that, to me, was exactly what a monitor does. But... Uh, so there, I wanted to ask you a couple of things, Whether whatever moniker you might want to put on it. I, I suppose oversight would be a, a fair moniker. But it went into an incredible level of detail down to the compliance consultant had to report on not only the discipline uh, rendered on employees who violated the electronic record keeping, but also whether that discipline was consistent throughout the organization, meaning from senior managers all the way down to the frontline traders. Is that something uh, you typically would see in an SEC order? And if not, why would you think the SEC would go to that level of detail? Um, I, th- I think you're right. And I, I see maybe the, the trajectory of your question suggests that I, do, I think this is a little bit um, – not in keeping with how typically these uh, settlements may go. I think the detail goes back to what you were saying before about how miffed the SEC was, how much they don't trust J.P. Morgan. Again, they had existing policies that they had flounded. So it's not an issue of the SEC saying, okay, well, now you got some policies. Let's make sure you're following them. They already had not been following them. And so we're already starting from a place where the SEC is not trusting um, the company I also, with you, I, I raised my eyebrows also at the compliance consultant because I thought, isn't this just a monitor or maybe we're just using a new term now? Um, but I, And so I, I think that they're really going to lean heavily on that person and make clear to J.B. Morgan that this is not something they're going to take lightly or that they're going to let this sort of fall by the wayside. I think they'll be continually checking in with that person to make sure that you know, they are, they're, they're keeping to what they said they would do. So let's look at some of the other stories uh, that caught our collective eyes this week. And the first one comes from uh, Michael Peregrine, and he's a partner at McDermott, Will, and Emory in Chicago. And he writes on, uh, usually on boards of directors, but he wrote a really interesting article on what he entitled The Lasting Positive Impacts of Sarbanes-Oxley. And this month is the 20th anniversary of the um, Enron bankruptcy. So there's been a lot written about Enron. Of course, after Enron came WorldCom, and shortly after WorldCom uh, collapsed, we had a really a very rapid uh, time for the U.S. Congress, the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley. And he reviewed uh, some of the major elements of uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, which, of course, num- number one was the establishment of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, the PCAOB, new standards for auditor independence, new responsibilities for public company audit committees, new requirements around uh, financial reporting to the SEC, a federal whistleblower law, the presager of uh, Dodd-Frank, new reporting requirements, uh, SOX 404, and enhanced criminal penalties. So uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, I think, impacted our world in multiple ways. Many people have pointed to SOX as a key reason for the explosion of FCPA cases a little bit later in the decade because of the 
reporting requirements led companies to internally investigate more, leading to more self-disclosure uh, as well. But a really interesting article by Michael, and uh, I've come to see if I can get him on a pod to talk about it. But uh, Enron still lives. Sarbanes-Oxley still lives. In fact, I've just done a pod series I'm going to post in January on the Enron trial. So um, I, and I remember uh, I met a woman uh, many years ago at, at a conference, and she was an uh, internal control specialist. And she graduated, I think, in 02 or 03 from college. And uh, she said, I owe my job to Sarbanes-Oxley. Mm-hmm. So there's even a class of, of professionals uh, Sarbanes-Oxley uh, created. I know that's uh, been big in your world as well. Definitely. I mean, it's funny because even when you were talking a minute ago about the trader tapes, is that that's what I, I remember listening to countless hours on the, you know, in the, in the wake of Enron and all of the other sort of attendant energy companies, and we were listening to those traders. <laughs> I mean, that Sarbanes actually then ushered in a lot of uh, job creation, I think, for attorneys and auditors after that as well. So what have you seen that uh, France is doing around its anti-bribery, anti-corruption regime? Yes, again, from the Global Anti-Corruption blog, which is typically run by Matthew Stevenson out of Harvard. Uh, this week, there was a fascinating um, story by Frederick Davis, who is uh, a lecturer at Columbia Law School, but he's a member of the bar in New York, but also in Paris. Um, So he's a French expert. Um, And he wrote what I think is a really interesting summary of where France is on anti-corruption enforcement and and anti-corruption laws. And he talks about sort of, you know, France nearly 15 years ago passed something that's akin to the FCPA, but the French version, And he notes that there wasn't really any movement on it for at least 15 years. There wasn't much at all that that France had done in the way of punishing um, corporate criminals who were involved in any sort of bribery or corruption. But that that has shifted somewhat in the last, you know, sort of handful of years. So he walks through, you know, a few interesting new um, uh, involved, um, sorry, uh, uh, (laughs) <laughs> um, things that have happened in France, one of which is this thing called the Loi Sapin de, which is the best I can do with my uh, French background, which is not much. Um, and that law increased the penalties for financial crimes and also allowed for a DPA uh, equivalent in France. And so that allowed what we were just referencing, sort of this idea that companies now can see that there is a carrot for um, going to see the authorities And self-reporting, there is, um, you know, also the other side of that is the increased penalties for lack of doing that or for engaging in any sort of international corruption. So he points out that there is this sort of increased uh, carrot and stick method that we've seen in the last handful of years from France. And so he was really, I think, pointing out that the French authorities have very much stepped up their prosecution of um, corruption activities and, and, and once, you know, I think he's sort of tipping his hat to this idea that France, which used to have very you know, minimal enforcement of this, now has fairly robust efforts toward combating corruption. So one of the things that intrigued me in the article, Karen, was the cha- or the procedural protections uh, which were provided to interviewees. Mm. And uh, that's something I've been thinking about a long time. Uh, because if you have an internal investigation, whether uh, it's run by your own internal uh, investigative team or you bring an outside counsel to do an investigation, at that point, there are no criminal charges, typically. Uh, so there are no criminal procedural protections, right. i.e. Miranda or any other protections. And uh, then if an internal investigation uncovers something and it's turned over to the government, the government may, may decide to prosecute an individual. So I've always been worried about that kind of procedural uh, point, but the French uh, authorities are actually moving to provide or to allow uh, interviewees to have their own counsel present, and uh, I think that's a a really positive step for interviewees. I recognize having sat across the table and interviewed these people, some people, it's much easier when they don't have a lawyer. Uh, So, uh, And it's a dilemma that uh, I still think is a open question here in the United States. Absolutely. And every time when I was in those interviews and the interviewee would ask, should I have an attorney present? There was, it was a little tricky. And especially after you've given this 
big sort of up John soliloquy in the beginning of the interview that says, you know, we're the corporation's lawyers. It does beg sort of the follow on question, which is, which should I have my own lawyer then? And, and that was always a tricky dance to do um, when you're, you're sitting there interviewing someone who uh, is, it, it's, I always thought that was a problematic, even ethically sort of stance sometimes. So I'm glad that France is, is stepping in that direction. I agree. So next up, more bad news for the serious fraud office in the United Kingdom as former Unit oil trader Paul Bond has now filed an appeal uh, based upon the overturning of the Ackle uh, conviction as well. Uh, they were two gentlemen who were con- Unit oil employees who were convicted of bribery and corruption. The Ackle decision overturned it based upon the misconduct of the serious fraud office. Unfortunately, that misconduct pointed all the way to the top to SFO Director Lisa Ofsofsky. Um It's still a little bit murky as to what precisely happened, but she allowed a representative of the principals of UniOil who uh, had come to the United States uh, somehow and uh, had pled out to the Department of Justice and were actively cooperating with the Department of Justice. This uh, representative was allowed to speak to English defendants without English defendants' counsel present and to try to persuade them to plead guilty. Uh, and the uh, in the ACL Court of Appeals decision, uh, the SFO was just excoriated for this. And so now the other defendant has uh, also filed an appeal and I can't imagine it's not going to succeed, so the SFO may well have a double black eye uh, over this. Mm-hmm. So uh, what happened uh, to FCPA compliance in 2021, at least according to Dick Casson? Sure. So Dick has an interesting um, blog post on the FCPA blog, in which he's summarizing a little bit of what has happened in compliance over this past year. The takeaway for me of this post seems to be pressure. The the compliance professionals are under a lot of pressure. And he talks about this being a result of having hybrid work models, not being able to travel to do interviews and checking out, you know, being able to have boots on the ground to look into maybe problematic issues abroad. He also talks about how the labor force is fairly unstable and that morale is down. I mean, people are exhausted. They've been stressed for a number of reasons over this year. And so there's just a lot of pressure on compliance professionals. In addition, that pressure comes from doing their job because companies are under pressure as a result of supply chain squeezes. So all of those factors really do dial up the heat, I think, for misconduct, certainly around cutting some corners and all the things that compliance professionals are often, you know, staying up at night worrying about. All of that this year really, I think, uh, just was exacerbated. And that seems to be Dick's takeaway from from this year. Uh, Next up, we had an article by Jonathan Marks at Baker Tilly who talked about internal controls and Netflix. And I would say it was a catastrophic a catastrophic internal control failure, but it was actually pretty mundane and pretty routine. And it was fraud in procurement where uh, someone who had control of the master vendor list uh, who could approve a vendor uh, could also approve payments. Uh, in uh, the technical legal terms, that's called a big no-no. Uh, and this person uh, then got kickbacks from these vendors who he hired to work at Netflix. And it, uh, like I said, it's a fairly well-known fraud, uh, and it does happen, unfortunately. But I guess the thing that struck me, Karen, was that uh, Netflix is viewed as a pretty sophisticated, pretty leading-edge company, certainly in entertainment. And to have this kind of failure, uh, almost as baseline a failure you can in your supply chain, and it's 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 remedied almost as easily as just a separation of uh, delegations of authority, Um so uh, even Netflix got uh, defrauded. So interesting article from our friend at uh, Jonathan Marks at Baker Tilly. So Vietnam, uh, first of all, John Rush has a great blog. It's called Dipping Through Geometries. He is as an eclectic uh, and uh, well-versed compliance professional in a wide variety of areas. And he always has some interesting takes. But uh, he had a, finally got back on his blog. So what did you see in this most recent edition? Yeah, I agree. John is a great guy and always has eclectic views. And I, I think he's been a little quieter on his blog because he was teaching at WNL Law this semester and doing a global corruption course. So we actually overlapped, which has been great. So the blog post 
this week um, is about Vietnam, as you said, but what's interesting about it is that uh, it's about wildlife tracking and this idea of, you know, illegal uh, animal products, wildlife products traveling internationally. And he points out that Vietnam was for a while a hub for some of these products and that more recently Vietnam has started to crack down on this. And recently, I think there was uh, just last week, um, a sentence against a rhino trader, so someone who was trading and, and moving rhino horns around the world, and they were discovered by Vietnam Vietnamese customs officials. Um, and so, I, I mean, these obviously are illegal. It's an interesting, I think, argument here about how, of course, these things dovetail with compliance if that i mean these uh laws are significantly important but often fall under the radar when we're thinking about corruption and compliance but all this is interconnected in the sense that this also affects supply chains to me i read these things and it, it strikes me that it's very similar to some of the ways companies are trying to get around some things like conflict minerals one of my favorite topics um, and other um, problematic products that have a, a global supply chain involvement. And so he mentions that, you know, Vietnam, as I said, was sort of the hub for a lot of these products, certainly out of Africa and Asia. But now they're able to take some more steps to really try to crack down on, on this practice of flying these things into Vietnam um, so I again appreciate John having a finger on the pulse of these areas of compliance that sometimes are often overlooked. So next up, we had an article from Lawrence Heim who writes in Practical ESG, and apparently, Karen, uh, lawyers have discovered ESG. Uh, I didn't know they lost it. Uh, perhaps they had never found it, but. Uh, he draws from a blog post from Freshfields, and he draws uh, four key reasons for this increase in legal uh, review or, or at least consideration of ESG. One is the, simply the global increase in ESG and sustainability laws. Apparently, there are over now 2,000, according to the latest research of the London uh, School of Economics. This one would be certainly near and dear to my heart and probably to yours as well, litigation. Who knew? There are close to 400 climate cases globally, so uh, companies want to understand what their obligations may be under those rules, and I'm sure some lawyers are looking at that going, hmm, new field, new area, new client development, let's get going. Uh, mm -hmm. Next, it's become, and this is really uh, tying back more to compliance, sustainability and indeed the entire ESG oeuvre now features uh, much more prominently in M&A transactions. As companies adjust their st strategy, they're having to review their business portfolios and acquisition strategies. And finally, investors' interest in corporate governance. Uh, we've seen uh, lots of commentary from institutional investors. We've seen the big uh, private equity funds also uh, uh, talk about ESG is a part of their portfolio, but it goes even to banks. Uh, banks are now looking at ESG programs regarding lending, and my favorite is insurance companies. They're uh, looking at that as an actuarial risk of whether they should insure and how much your premium will charge. So uh, it's good to have us lawyers involved for a change. So uh, for our last story on prioritizing your policy updates, what did you see, Karen? Karen? Sure. So David Banks uh, has an interesting article on risk and compliance matters, and it's it's entitled 20 questions uh, to ask when prioritizing your policy development efforts. And this isn't sort of global policy in the sense of, you know, what do we think about uh, just worthy or anything like this is actually policies that your company has uh, and the amount of documents that employees have at their um, at their fingertips to learn about the goals and uh, the sort of values of the company. So the questions are, I think, all very insightful, helpful, things like, you know, does this document communicate the executive direction here? What happens if, this, if there isn't this document? Is there clarity? I mean, the major takeaways behind these 20 questions, um, all of which are important, but really focuses on what we have always seen as the hallmarks of a good compliance policy. And that would be things like transparency, uh, clarity, making sure people understand what it is the rules and regulations are, the policies are, uh, 
Uh, and then I think an, an ability to understand that those things have been communicated in, in a way that everyone can understand. Um, in addition, this idea of what happens if that, if that policy is violated is one of the important questions as well. Um, the takeaway for him is, and at the end of this blog, is really to be clear that the, everything is documented, that these documents that create the policies and that um, really put the policies on paper are so critical in every stage of a company. And we certainly know that. I have been looked at compliance, uh, the compliance field for this long. I do think what's interesting about this um, is that now that most people are working from home and we have uh, you know, this COVID that seems to never be going away, so much of these things are documented, um, meaning that there's a paper trail for so much because people aren't having face-to-face -face conversations anymore. And how I think that is good for most people, um, and certainly as, as you can now reference back to what, um, what is on paper in terms of what your company expects of you. So I would certainly suggest everyone take a look at these very important and insightful 20 questions that he's laid out to, as, as you consider the effectiveness of existing policies or if there are gaps in, in your company's policy. So, Karen, we're now on to uh, some podcasts I'd like to highlight. Uh, first of all, I want to start with uh, my colleague, Megan Doherty, who is the producer of many of my podcasts at One Stone Creative. She is a huge Marvel Cinematic Universe fan. In fact, as big as me. So we decided we're going to do the entire oeuvre. And we started with, of course, well, actually, and we're doing them in chronological order. So we had Captain America. Uh, we've now posted Captain Marvel. Next week, we're going to have Iron Man. So if you want something a little bit lighter for your uh, holiday listening pleasure, check out uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, Meg and I are very different. So we have some very different takes on it, but it's a ton of fun. Also, on The Compliance Life this month, I'm featuring my first trade di uh, compliance director, Matt Silverman, and Matt uh, has now moved into the trade director chair. So uh, it's an interesting, uh, his journey is very interesting, how he got to the trade director. On Hidden Traffic, Gwen Hassan uh, brings us Andrew Wallace, the head of Unseen UK. Um, I finally got off my duff and started a Separate podcast for everything compliance, shout outs, and rants. So the true fan favorite is now on iTunes and it's already generating some buzz. But now we get to Karen Woody, who has the Classroom Insider podcast. Karen, I was wondering if you could maybe spend a few minutes talking to us about kind of your idea, what is a Classroom Insider, at least for your podcast, and then go through the two that have posted and the one that we'll uh, post next week. Sure. Thank you. And thanks for giving me the airtime to talk about this. This is something that has been near and dear to my heart and has been very much something I've been enjoyed doing this semester. Classroom Insiders is the name of the podcast that I host in conjunction with my students at WNL University School of Law. And so what we have done is that each week I've entered, I've, uh, or each episode, I interview a different student on the content that we had discussed throughout the semester. And what we've discussed through the semester is the arc of really the hundred years of insider trading regulation and how it has shifted really significantly in different periods uh, uh, in, in history. So we started with um, one of my students, Ben Ritchie, who discussed the 33-34 Act, the era of sort of the heyday of insider trading regulation of the 60s with the, with the SEC. And then in the last episode, we shifted to the beginning of the Justice Powell jurisprudence of insider trading. Justice Powell is a famous alumnus of WNL, so we have to spend a lot of time talking about him. But also, he's one of the most important um, architects of insider trading regulation as we know it today through a couple of very important cases. And so this last uh, episode, we talked about Chiarella, one of the very important cases that establishes uh, the necessity of a fiduciary duty in order to be um, convicted of insider trading. And then next week, we'll talk about Dirks versus SEC. So the beginning of this idea of a personal benefit test as a required element for insider trading. And then beyond that, we'll talk about more recent cases as this podcast goes on um, up through modern day. So it's been, it's been a great time. It's been nice to have students 
really show me what they've been learning through class and, and by way of an interview. And so it's, it's been great. I hope everyone tunes in. So what was the student rep- response when you proposed this idea, Karen? Well, it was a bit of a proposal, but also a requirement of the class. Uh, I have to say, everyone was very nervous. And to a student, they said at the end of the podcast, they were like, oh, that was way better than I thought it would be. I think there's a little bit of uh, nervousness because it's a new form, you know, and, and the idea that it's being recorded, uh, I thought was it's a good way to assess them. And it's a good skill for them to know as they are um, um, soon to be off to be attorneys. They need to be able to think on their feet and 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 talk through what they know. So, I, overall, I think it's been it's been a hit. So, I will have an insider trading question I want to pose to you, and uh, it's uh, a hypothetical, of course, uh, because it was posed to me, and it's the following: Would a technician on a movie set where a Peloton product is used? Uh, and uh, in the movie as a prop and a character who's on the Peloton does his Peloton and then shortly thereafter has a heart attack and dies. Uh, That's the facts. So if that movie technician then shorts or longs Peloton anticipating some response, would that be insider trading? I would say... No. I mean, the closest you get is if there's some understanding that everyone on the movie set should hold everything in confidence in the sense that, you know, that would be like working on Game of Thrones and knowing who's going to get off the next week. That's a little different. But in terms of then recognizing, putting two and two together and recognizing this might have an effect on a particular company, of which there is no insider of that company necessarily there. It's a little like the Carpenter case with the Wall Street Journal and, and the herd on the street uh, was, was the information that they were aware of the day before it would run. And so they knew that that would affect the stocks about which the article uh, was aimed. So that is where we see the beginning of misappropriation theory, and that definitely now has legs. And so I think the SEC would take that case uh, happily after we saw the Panawatt case where someone was an insider and put two and two together and realized that, of course, he probably couldn't trade in the merger about his company, but recognized a peer company of theirs was going to be similarly situated and traded in that. And the SEC came after him by saying, well, you only made that trade because of your inside information. But that inside information didn't have anything to do with the company he traded in. And so we've seen just this August, that's when that case came out, this extension of misappropriation to places no one thought would happen, certainly not Justice Powell. And so I would say, no, I don't think that's insider trading. Would the SEC bring the case? Maybe. (laughs) Well, Karen, this has been a ton of fun and a great episode. Uh, I wanted to wish all of our listeners Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Karen, for joining me and sitting in for Jay. And you want to wish our listeners uh, Merry Christmas? Of course. And thank you so much, Tom. It's always a joy to be here. Merry Christmas to all of the listeners. This is Tom Fox again. Thanks again for listening to our special Naughty List edition of This Week in FCPA. This will be our final This Week in FCPA for 2021. So in addition to wishing you a Merry Christmas, I would also wish you a very safe, happy, and joyous New Year. We'll be back in 2022, both myself and Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors, to take a look at some of the first week of 2022's top stories. So I hope you will join us. We've got several new podcasts coming out on the Compliance Podcast Network, and we're going to have a special series on the Enron trial in January of 2021. So look for that on the Compliance Podcast Network. Thanks again for listening. I hope you have a joyous rest of the year. And if you listen to this in 2022, I hope you've had a great start of the year. Thank you. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.